Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Ship It number nine. Uh, today it is tips, performance tips from the storefront renderer team. Ship It is our monthly event where we gather engineering shop folk and we talk about the things that we're working on and we take questions from all of you that have decided to join us today. Um, Ship It was created as a way for us to get together and contact and have um, you know, meaningful discussions with each other in this digital space. Uh, my name is Anita Clark. I'm the senior managing editor at Shopify. I run the engineering blog. And today we're talking about performance with Ruby. And my guests are part of the storefront renderer team. And that team increased the performance of our storefront render engines response. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Almost five times. Um, so they're here to talk to us about how they did that and hopefully you can get some tips that you can um, apply to your own application. So we're taking questions at the end of this presentation. Please use the Q&A mode in the chat and we'll get to them. Uh, and I want to welcome Max and Celso here for us um, to talk about performance tips. Thanks. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Max. Uh, I am here today with my colleague, Celso. Uh, so I, uh, we are both on the storefront rendering team at Shopify, and uh, we're going to have a nice hour together to talk about performance, and uh, more specifically, Ruby uh, performance. So um, from wherever you are in the world, uh, welcome. We are both of us in Canada today. It is minus 25. Uh, so hopefully, it's a bit warmer where you are. Um, I am a senior developer on the storefront rendering team. And uh, Celso, if you want to take a few seconds to introduce yourself as well. Yep, my name is Celso. I am a staff developer on the storefront rendering team too. So uh, basically today, uh, as we've uh, discussed a bit earlier today, we're going to be talking about how we improve performance for the storefront rendering engine that's powering basically all of the Shopify storefronts here at Shopify. And uh, in the way this presentation is going to be going, we're going to be talking a bit about the rendering engine itself, what it does, how it works, and uh, then jump into some numbers to give you a bit of an idea of the scale that we're dealing with, with all the Shopify storefronts on the platform. Then we're going to jump into how we optimize data access specifically to make that a bit faster than it was before. And finally, we're going to talk about how we uh, optimize memory allocations or uh, in other words, how we reduced memory allocations to make sure that we have the fastest response times possible, given that Ruby has this garbage collector doing its thing. We want to prevent it from doing too much while we're processing requests. Um, so quick introduction to how the uh, storefront rendering engine works. If you've read the two blog posts that we have, you may have uh, understood or noticed that uh, essentially everything was going in uh, the monolith before. So Shopify. Uh, from its very inception to almost 15 years ago has always been this monolithic uh, Ruby and on Rails application where everything was mostly being uh, added to. In the past two years, we started working on a completely separate application that would implement the storefront part of Shopify only. And that's where everything storefront would be implemented and only there. So this uh, decision to extract the application to a different stack entirely. It is still a Ruby application. It is still um, something that we, you know, we try to keep it as close as possible as what we have before, um, but with the goal of optimizing it to do one thing and do it really, really well. And what that engine does is basically when you go on any Shopify storefront, um, say you go on a product page and uh, you see the shop's header with a logo, a bunch of links for navigation, you see the product images, you see uh, all the information for the product you're about to purchase, that's something that's processed by the rendering engine on the server side. Now, the reason uh, everything is a bit special in terms of how storefronts work is that every merchant can have their own theme on their own storefront. So Shopify being a multi-tenant application, uh, we have to handle different themes, different shops, different products for basically everyone and make sure it's fast for everyone. So really what the engine does is it considers whatever the request is. So for example, for that product page, it would consider uh, what product it is for. Then based on what the product needs to be loading, uh, we're going to look at what the shop is, its storefront theme, the liquid theme that the shop is using for its published theme, and then figure out what the actual template for the product uh, requires. So if it requires some images, some variant data, some inventory data, 
Uh, that's all going to be uh, fetched from MySQL or from Redis or any sort of data store we have where uh, we expect to find that information. And then once it has everything, it processes the, the, the request, generates some HTML or JSON, and then spits that back out to the client browser. Uh, and at that point, everything that happens on the client side, the engine doesn't care about. It's really just responsible for figuring out what HTML or JSON, whatever service ad response it has to, to render, basically. Um, so that's what the engine does. Now, in terms of numbers, uh, interestingly, or rather not so surprisingly, we are seeing a trend of more and more people shopping online. And especially this year, I think, with the pandemic that uh, forced a bit of online shopping uh, where it's not as easy or even possible to shop in person anymore. So we are seeing a major trend. A lot of people are shopping online more and more. And uh, combined with the fact that more and more merchants are signing up for Shopify, this leads to a situation where we need to make sure we have the capacity to make sure that we're able to serve that storefront traffic as fast as before, but also that we are able to sustain that traffic over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, as we're going to see that trend potentially grow up again. Um, the interesting thing that also happens every year is we have a lot of high load scenarios uh, throughout the year. If we have one or a handful of merchants where on a given day, they have what we call a flash sale event, meaning that uh, the storefront may have almost nothing going on at, uh, or like a regular amount of, of traffic going on. And then out of nowhere, there is a single day where they have a ton of sales uh, because they pushed a big uh, promotion or big marketing event uh, on social media. And when that happens, we have to deal with a bunch of traffic uh, coming up at a single moment that we're not really expecting. So dealing with those high-load scenarios, another one is Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which was just a few uh, weekends ago. Uh, throughout which we saw a lot of traffic coming on and uh, a lot of sales happening as well. One of the interesting stats I want to I want to zoom in a bit more here is the one at the bottom right corner. I'm going to zoom that in here for you. So that's uh, that the number of consumers purchasing from Shopify merchants has grown by 50% since last year, and that's uh, that was a stat we've uh, gotten from the last PFCM just now uh, a few weekends ago, and uh, it is clear that this is going to continue in the future as uh, more people continue to shop online than they would before. So with that in mind, uh, we want to make sure that everything stays really fast, uh, that everything is stable and resilient to high load scenarios, but also that we as developers have a strong foundation for the next maybe 20 years of how we uh, work on this thing. So. Let's look now at how we optimize access to the storefront data that we need to load, right? So I mentioned earlier, if you go on a product page, for example, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna need to load the product information itself, information about the shop, the theme, and a bunch, a bunch of other um, data based on what the liquid theme requires for that specific page. Starting out real quick into one of MySQL's uh, features that we're using for this rendering engine. Um, so, if you're familiar with MySQL uh, or SQL in general, you know you can do uh, one query fetching data from multiple tables uh, using a join. So if you have a few resources that are somehow split up through uh, foreign keys, you can say, I also want to use that uh, resource loaded at the same time through a join. That's quite useful. But something that happens sometimes in our case is we need to load data from multiple tables that have no strong relationship together. Uh, for example, if we want to load data from uh, the shop table you see there, and then the themes table, and then the products table, then all of those tables don't necessarily have a strong uh, you know, link between them as, say, with a foreign key. And uh, we wouldn't be able to do a join to get one single uh, query, select query, to get all that data out. But MySQL has this nice multi-statement feature that basically lets you do exactly that without going through joins or whatever. And what that allows you to do is basically send a single query. So that's one round trip to that external data store of uh, MySQL and get the data for all three queries back in one go. So you don't have to send one query for the shops, one query for the themes, and then another one for the products. And you can add maybe, maybe five, 10 tables in there if you want, uh, or queries. Rather, in this case, it happens that we match them one by one by two tables. But you can do that for any sort of query you want if uh, they're not necessarily related. Uh, within themselves. That's all fine. And, uh, you know, it's it's a nice feature to have, but where it really shines in our use case is 
we have this bookkeeper mechanism that will basically keep track of all the requests that are going on for a specific kind of of, pay, of storefront request. So for example, what you see here is, I'm gonna bring up the whiteboard here for a second. So what you see here is basically we have this request zero. Now, assuming that this is the very first time that this rendering engine we have sees a request of this kind, meaning for uh, the products slash shoes uh, request path, uh, what happens is basically we're going to have to load everything, maybe n plus ones, maybe requests that are not optimized and everything, because we don't really have a good idea of what this particular type of request requires. So what happens there is the storefront renderer, the engine will go and load uh, the product information, the collection information, the product images, and all of those are separate queries going on uh, that have, you know, their own connection potentially to uh, the MySQL database, and that introduces a lot of, you know, overhead for everything um, network related, which is not great. So we get that data out from MySQL or Redis, whatever the data store is, and what you see here is the bookkeeper keeps track of every single request going in or going out to MySQL. And then what happens for the next request of the same type, so saying for the same shop, uh, the same request path, so products slash shoes, uh, the same, you know, multiple characteristics end up being this, uh, creating this cache key that when it matches, and we've seen something for that before, we're going to use that multi-statement feature to load a bunch of those queries all in one go and at the very beginning of the request. What that allows is basically prevent a bunch of, you know, n plus ones going out for multiple tables because we know we're going to, or anyway, we're pretty confident that we are going to need all of that data anyway, since the last request of that same type, the same cache key needed that data. So we are taking the guess, which is often a good estimate uh, and a good guess that we will need all that data. So let's just load everything up front and we don't have to go all the way to MySQL a bunch of times, which really accelerates uh, response times in terms of how we see the responses um, take less or more time. We definitely see an improvement when we uh, start using that that uh, bookkeeper mechanism. And in terms of you know data, uh, once we actually rolled it out to production, we notice a very uh, significant decrease in response time, specifically for shops that tend to load a lot of data. So if you have a large merchant, uh, perhaps a wholesale merchant selling a bunch of products. And uh, you can imagine say, a collection page which uh, with a ton of products in there and a bunch of images, a bunch of you know information about inventory, all that stuff. Um, instead of, do, of doing them all in, into a single query every time for each product, uh, that's all going to be loaded into one go for that collection. Um, so P99, uh, P90, and P75 uh, response times are especially uh, positively affected in that they're getting better. But for shops that have a tiny amount of product, we don't really see an improvement, which is somehow expected because of uh, the the lesser gains of having this mechanism going on. So it's, it really shines for merchants with a ton of um, resources happening at the same time. Now, that's not all. The other thing we want to have is in terms of caching, uh, we don't necessarily want to have one single layer of caching and just have that layer do everything. The other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to just rely on caching and kind of cheat your way out of slow cache misses to say, oh, it's fine. We have a cache. We're, we're good. You know, unless you have a very, very good cache hit rate, uh, that won't cut it. So you're going to have to make sure that first you have very fast cache misses so that once that's done and you're confident that you have everything going on, then you're going to want to then start adding to, to more layer of caching. But before that, really, that's not something you want to do. You really want to start by making sure you have the best cache misses performance possible. In our case, that's what we did. We actually didn't introduce any caching for a lot of time uh, for multiple months. Uh, we didn't want to add caching in there. And uh, once we were comfortable with the amount of caching we or of performance we had on cache misses, we then started to introduce some caching layers. And what you're seeing there is basically multiple layers. So layer one, layer two, layer three, and layer four. Kind of like a CPU where you have uh, L1, L2, level three caches, where the first one is usually the fastest and the closest to the actual place where you need that data. In the actual Ruby process where we run the rendering engine, 
we have what we call an in-memory cache. And you can basically see that as just a big global uh, you know, hash or object in memory that stores a bunch of data going on in uh, requests. Now, this uh, in-memory cache layer is visible across requests. So it's useful for us to have, say, um, for the same shop, a lot of data that stays within that memory cache. And so if more requests come in for that same shop, we can just fetch the data right out of the memory cache instead of having to go all the way to an external data store or even, uh, even locally. It's always faster to have it right in memory in the process that we're dealing with. If we're looking for something that's not in that in-memory cache, we're going to fall back to a Redis instance that's running right on the machine where the rendering engine works. So we don't have to reach out to an external data store. It's on that same machine, which is going to be a lot faster, but still a bit slower than what we would have with the in-memory cache. If we don't have something on that specific machine at that point, then we fall back to Redis, which is the external Redis that we call, and that it's not on the machine itself, but we still have Redis rather than MySQL as our third layer. And then if something is not in the sharded Redis that's external to the machine, we then fall back to MySQL, which is the canonical data uh, source of truth. But it's, of course, probably the slowest of them all. And that's why we try to not have to go there too often. But you know, we have to do it for the initial request, like I mentioned, with the, the bookkeeper. And uh, once we have that data back, we then cache it at the appropriate layers. And uh, the LRU, least recently used algorithm, will take care of get every, everything um, optimized. And that something that we don't need or that we haven't used recently is just going to disappear from the caches. And we can have uh, what we need the most. In terms of how we memoize things, now there's another interesting uh, mechanism we use to make sure we don't have to load a bunch of data at the same time all the time. And that's a liquid drop memoizer. So Liquid itself, uh, the library, uh, internally has this concept of a drop, like liquid, drop, get it. Uh, the, the usual way we call them, maybe from externally at Shopify, uh, if you're a partner, uh, you may know those as objects. So say the product object, the collection object, internally to us, that's a drop, the product drop, the collection drop in the way we built them. And if on a specific product page, for example, you have multiple references to the same object or for us, for the same drop, uh, like you see in uh, the example on the left, you have the, uh, I'm going to bring that back again. So here you have the, yeah, that color is not great. I'm going to remove it. It's totally fine. So product title, product description, and then product price. All of those are referencing the same object, the same product drop, the same product really in the end. Um, what we definitely don't want to do is load that product multiple times when that happens. You want to load it once and then refer to that same object. Of course, when we have that product object, that's fine. But what happens sometimes is if later on in that same page, you have a reference to the same product, but through another way of accessing things. So like if you load the multiple collections of the shop and then go into the shoes collection and then load the products from that shoes collection and then loop over all the products in uh, that collection itself, what you're going to end up with, assuming that the initial product at the very beginning was a product in the shoe collection, is you're going to basically load that same product again, which is not great. So what we do is we have this liquid drop memoizer that basically looks at everything we've loaded so far for the request. And uh, if something we need is already loaded in memory, then we just use it right away. We don't have to go all the way back to MySQL. We don't have to go all the way back to Redis. It's right there. We just use it as it is. On the right, what you see in that chart there, or in that uh, that metrics, or that those curves right there, you can see that on the product side of things, so like for the product objects, the product drops, the average number of accesses to memoize drops for all requests across all Shopify on average is around 20. So what happens, what that means is for any particular request coming into Shopify's infrastructure for a product page, we prevent 20 accesses to an external data store thanks to that memoizer. So instead of having to go maybe 20 times to MySQL or Redis or whatever that data store is, uh, we just use what we have right away in memory, which is a major lifesaver for uh, preventing accesses to data stores that we, you know, we can prevent since we have it in memory already. Um, so that's another useful mechanism we have for that. Another thing, in terms of how the storefront works in uh, on the Shopify platform, Every storefront has its own Shopify theme, its own liquid theme. 
And it is possible that some of those teams are more optimized in terms of what they cost to do on the back end. We try to make it as fast as we can. But of course, you can make things better yourself if you want and if you can. So if you are a partner or a merchant watching this and you are a bit technical, or you're willing to get your hands dirty with the code, uh, I highly recommend taking a look at what we call the Shopify Theme Inspector. That tool basically gives you a better idea of how much time that rendering engine we're building, uh, where it spends its time when it's rendering requests for your own shop, your own storefront. So it's going to show you, for example, it takes uh, 500 milliseconds to render that specific uh, template and then 20 milliseconds for that specific snippet. And all of those uh, combined end up, uh, end up doing that specific amount of time for the rendering. And you can see what takes the longest and then you know find those bottlenecks and make it a bit quicker. If you, if you have a better idea of where it is slow, then you can act on it. So I highly recommend going to uh, that specific blog post and installing that, uh, that tool. So a super useful thing to use. With that, I'm going to send it over to my colleague Celso, who's gonna to talk to you about the memory awareness now of the Ruby code rewrite to make sure that we um, keep things fast and lean in terms of memory. Awesome, thank you, Maxim. Um, yeah, so another thing that is um, very important from our side is to write um, what we call like memory aware um, code or memory aware uh, Ruby code because, well, it's dealing with a Ruby application. Um, and something to be, um, to be aware of is that, well, Ruby, we have the garbage collector, garbage collector, which basically like anything, or I guess in any language, but anything that you put in, uh, in memory, anything that is created at some point, it also needs to be uh, removed. So uh, with that in mind, um, we always try to write code that we put less stuff into memory as possible. Like I, we, I like to call say that um, like the garbage collection cleaning time or the marking sweep phase is like a it's a wasted time. Um, I'm being I'm being a little bit harsh here, but the idea is that whenever the marking sweep phase is is running, it's literally it's a stop the world execution, which means you're not doing anything at that time. So we've seen cases. Um, Shopify or doing the development of storefront render that we've seen garbage collection running for more than four seconds. Sometimes we even, we even more than that. Um, you can see uh, below a uh, profiler that shows that for that specific request, we had a, a garbage collection stop the world execution for almost one second. Uh, that is unacceptable for an application where we're trying to achieve uh, for every single request uh, less than 200 milliseconds of rendering times. Um, so and another thing that we need to um, keep uh, be aware of is that we are dealing with like liquid templates, uh, which as Maxime mentioned, um, it can be a variety of things that can be thrown at us. So merchants can write anything they want on a liquid template, which can be a lot of like a string interpolation uh, or string, sorry, string uh, manipulation, a lot of like um, patching and loading a lot of data from the data, from the data stores. Um, so we try to, we have to be aware and smart um, to put the least amount of pressure on the memory as we can because every time you put something in the memory, the garbage collectors eventually have to remove it, right? So we are dealing with like a very high throughput and high volume application. And in our scenario, uh, in our case, every millisecond counts. So if you can remove 10 millisecond or two millisecond, one millisecond from the garbage collection from being executed at all, um, that is a big win for us. And that's basically what we want. So I'm gonna reiterate this, that this is something that we keep, um, we pay attention a lot. We, and now we pay attention a lot doing the whole process of development of Star from Render, the new engine, is to pay attention to not create unnecessary objects. Um, and that's like, the, our, like one of the, our motives to be aware of every time we write code to like, don't execute, don't create anything that we don't need and reuse objects whenever possible. So I'm gonna go some, uh, some uh, points here, some uh, topics about a uh, few things that we uh, do uh, in Star for Render. One of them is the use of uh, 
array.map with a bang instead of just use the, the array.map. The difference here is that the with a bang, the map with the exclamation mark is that objects are, um, it modifies objects in place. It does not create a secondary or duplicates the map of the array and to which avoids um, completely like the, the garbage collection having to deal with that. And we can take a look at like one example here is that on the left side, both basically like on both sides, we have uh, ex almost the same code. Line one on both sides, we have uh, the creation of like a, an array of a thousand uh, elements, um, a thousand integers. And the only difference between the two, two so both sides is that on line four, we be, we're using a map with no exclamation mark, with no bang, and the right side we are. And you can see that the memory profile is like a very nice tool that we basically show that we are creating more, well, like an extra object, like eight, a thousand bytes on that on the right side on the right side we do not we don't which basically means it's it's a it's just less pressure that we put on a memory or sorry on a garbage collector that um, will eventually have to be cleaned of course we need to be aware that uh, this can introduce bugs like we need to be aware or know that the object that we are going to be um, modifying in place it's not going to be needed to the original object or the original array does not uh, is not needed in somewhere else uh, somewhere else in your code, um, and if you do, you're going to have to accept that uh, the penalty. But um, whenever you can, we always use uh, we always modify objects in place. Um, another thing that is um, important to know is the avoiding the use of in string concatenation. So it's really like the use of of the string interpolation instead of using string concatenation. And the TLDR is, well, always use string interpolation because let's see for one example here. On the left side, we have um, on like this minute profiler execution here um, that shows that we are basically doing this, this, uh, this piece of code line two and three, we're basically doing getting uh, a variable Z and then just contact like joining with like two other strings A and B. But this simple operation is creating five objects. Like we only need two objects here. One is the Z variable that contains the Z word and then the, the resulting of the X. Um, but because of the operation that Ruby is doing here, we basically have three other objects that are allocated that the garbage collection will have to clean up eventually. This is very simple, but when you, uh, when you imagine or when you deal with the scale of uh, requests that we're doing with the volume of requests, a few extra bytes is, uh, takes time from, from on, on our side, which we don't want. We don't want the garbage collection to win at all. And you can see here on the right side, using the string interpolation instead of a concatenation, we only get two objects created. So that is way more performant. It just saves um, extra objects from being created in the data from on the memory um, at all. Um, the third thing is um, use of empty constant objects. And I will uh, give like more details about what I mean by that is that, but like the idea is that if you're dealing with empty things like if you're dealing with an empty string or empty array and empty hash and you only need to deal with that that's the objects that you need to either read read or maybe serialize to something else there is no need to create extra objects or extra empty objects when you only need to deal with empty here's an example of a method that we are calling with just returning an empty hash. Um, it's very simple, but the issue with that is that if you call the method empty five times, you're gonna get five empty hash, five different objects allocated in memory. If you do not need to do any kind of manipulation that hash, if you only need to return that empty hash and maybe serialize it to something else, serialize it to JSON, serialize it to XML, or do any kind of like other computation that involves empty, that is wasted resources, a wasted um, memory that you are allocating. 
we can see here that on the right side, this is the approach that we take. We create, we have a module called last allocations that we initialize some, um, some objects, in the case, the empty hash and empty array. And that is, well, that is included in line two and three is, um, is created during boot time. So it's, it's one object or two objects that are created in boot during boot time. And then whenever we need to call and represent uh, empty return or something that is empty, and we know that we're not going to be um, changing or mutating that object at all, we call it. Because if you call now on the right side in line seven, and if you call that method five times, you're only going to get with the first object, you only get the same object. So th that saves that that saves memory from being used at all, or at least used more than once. And the freeze um, call on both line two and three is to prevent us from introducing any bugs in case somewhere of the code we don't expect, but somewhere the code might be wanting to either push something else inside the array or add some or change or delete or do some kind of manipulation on a hash that will basically caught, catch, be caught on uh, tests. So that prevents us from introducing between an empty and then that other, uh, that other execution um, manipulating or changing that object that we are gonna be reusing elsewhere. Um, but there's a question here, like, cool, you made all the changes, you made all the things like in terms of you did only string interpolation, you were only doing, uh, you're always using map uh, with the exclamation mark, mark uh, map bang, and you're only using, um, const for your uh, empty returns. How do you make sure that in the future you don't um, make any changes or either maybe you introduce a new gem or something that um, started creating more objects because you're just using something and then that uh, you're using like a, a method call on a specific gem or maybe you up, uh, updated a gem and that now your memory execute memory uh, consumption is just ballooning and then you garbage collection is now out of control. Um, I made a mistake there. So anyway, so the point is, the last thing is um, to talk about is um, frozen string literal. Uh, that's like the last thing that we need to talk about. Um, this is like something that is probably today is very common uh, in, um, in any like Ruby code today in terms of using the frozen string literal there, um, which like similar to what I described before in terms of the, the constants, the constant array and the constant hash, um, this is automatic today in Ruby if you have this magical string on top of line one, that every time you call uh, the frozen string on line three there, the same object will be returned that string there is frozen, which means it, will never, it cannot be changed. And if you call like five times, five times, it will just gonna be turning the same, uh, the same uh, string object only one time, only the first time the string will be allocated. If you need to do it and change that um, string um, because you need to do some concatenation or some other manipulation of that string, you can do the plus sign. This should be standard today, but this is something that important to mention. Um, we, sorry, we just had like the slides um, swap there. So the thing is to, to, to be aware of is that how do you make sure that you're like, you make you, you, your, your, or your, you have your, um, your Ruby code now under control in terms of uh, memory consumption, right? Three things that you have to do to make, keep, keep everything under control. One of them is uh, benchmark your memory allocations. So in TRDR, it's just at a searches and tests. The next thing is profiling and tracing uh, to make sure you are you know where what and maybe where you need to uh, improve areas and also dashboards to make sure you watch um, progress of your application in case you have something that you need to um, change or um, that you cannot be you 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 didn't catch during tests or during um, profiling and or in the traces, right? So something is use a memory profiler or any tool that you want to make sure that you have a control of your 
um, your memory allocations. Uh, on this example here, um, this is a test that we, this is a very similar test to what we do on our side on Star from Render. Um, line six, you can see in line six and seven, we just basically have two assertions. On line six, we, um, we check the memory, uh, the, the byte size that were allocated. And something to um, take from this is that you do not need to be precise on the num amount of bytes that are allocated, amount of objects that are allocated. The important thing here that we do and we think that we believe is to um, be aware of at least have a budget or um, an expectation of how many, at least have a ceiling of how many bytes or objects are being allocated. In our case here on line six, we have a range. And the reason for that is because you also, we, you might have, we have all the threads running on the background that might fluctuate a little bit your memory allocation. So we are okay with giving a range, but the point here is that if you add a gem, if you add a new piece of code that tomorrow, instead of having five or 10 um, bytes being allocated, you have 500, you have a thousand, that's where you step back and see, okay, so what changed? Is this gem that might be that might be introducing this this ballooning of memory consumption? Um, so that tool, like this uh, is approach, gives us like a very like good um, control and um, like very like a confirmation that our code is memory allocation is under control and it's totally fine as well. If like tomorrow you have made a change, you expect to actually instead of ten, it's okay to be twenty. That's okay, but at least you have an idea of that your code is not ballooning. It's not coming from 10 to 20 to 1,000 or 2,000 because you introduce a new gem. And that is also some of the points that at sometimes uh, it happened that we introduce a new gem that caused a ballooning and then we evaluated if we actually need this gem or if we can actually um, jump into the gem and do some fixes to, to fit our requirement. Um, the other thing is, Profiling and tracing that helps like a lot of um, investigating problems that we might have and know where to fix. Here we have an example of a tracing uh, for a card controller, um, and this gives it like us a, a, a lot of information about uh, things that were executed, when they were executed, and how long they took. And from the topic of memory and garbage collection, is the tracing also gives us like information about how many context switches we had, how many garbage cycles are ran, and how many, how much was the duration of uh, the garbage collection. This an example here was pretty good. Um, nothing was allocated, uh, or at least like not, the garbage collection didn't have to do any job at all. Um, but sometimes you will see like that's where we will see like a few seconds or a few milliseconds of execution of garbage collection, and that makes us have to like reevaluate, okay, this piece of code, why? Like maybe this is a specific thing that's doing something specific that we didn't think about that is going to a loop or something that is generated a bunch of unnecessary objects. And so this is something that uh, it's a tool that helps us a lot um, identifying issues and know where to um, tackle next. And the last one is dashboards. Um, I'm not gonna show any image here, but the point is, um, Keep dashboards and watch for uh, your memory allocation or your memory consumption on every uh, process and virtual machine you have. Um, keep uh, dashboards as well for like garbage collection execution, execution time and how many times it's running. So you know if you're having any issues with you allocating too much or maybe the, you're over stressing the garbage collector. Um, that will give you like tools and ideas to what to look for and how to like, okay, this is the area of code that you need to investigate. And you basically use the tracing and the profiling to identify what specific piece of code you need to um, optimize. So with that, um, Maxime mentioned, um, that comes to the end of the presentation. Maxime mentioned about um, IO optimizations and how we actually try to be as smart as possible to fetch data to reduce stresses on external um, external uh, data stores. And you just heard um, memory optimization and how we try to allocate less um, on the Ruby side in our code. And that's it. Well, thank you for joining us. That was great. Uh, I'm just gonna flip this one over.
because I love our new branding. Should have got some new branding thanks to some friends in broadcast at Shopify, which I totally love. So I'm like, we have to show off the new slides. Uh, so we're going to get started with your questions. You can ask questions in the chat. Use the question mode and we'll get to them. Uh, we got 20 minutes, so lots of time. Uh, dump your questions in and let's start with the first one. The first one is, after the initial page load, when a user navigates to another page, do you prefetch that next page and render it with the storefront renderer? Or is this a client-side only request rendered by the client? That is a good question. So the rendering engine renders all storefront traffic. So there's no, uh, in some cases, we render a few things with the renderer. In other cases, we don't. Um, and given that this is a server-side concern, everything that happens on the client side uh, doesn't really pertain to that particular engine. What the client side could be doing, uh, say the theme itself could be doing something where uh, when you hover on a link, you could preload the page. That's something I know some browsers try to do uh, internally in the browser engines themselves, but the render itself doesn't really have to worry about that. It merely receives a request from browsers and based on what it receives, then uh, returns responses. So uh, nothing really happens on the client side in terms of the rendering engine. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, Salsa, do you wanna add anything to that? Just no, nope, that was perfect. Cool. Um, on to our next question. How do you invalidate your different caching layers? So wanna... Yeah, sure. Like it, it really depends. Like we have uh, token keys for specific um, models or sometimes the shop might have uh, a versioning or product might have a versioning. We have versions for, for assets. Um, so every time something changes on our background, that ID is, is changed. Um, when we do the first um, time we, we, we hit um, a storefront, uh, we load those keys first. So we know if whatever we have on the cache is too valid based on those IDs. So it's just a number going up. And we are, of course, we have different ones for if you change the image, if you change the product, if you have a shop. So something to add there as well is given that we have multiple layers and in some cases we want to uh, favor certain layers more than others, especially in high load scenarios. It happens that if we detect a lot of traffic for a single shop at some point, uh, we're going to favor that shop to go to a higher layer or a layer closer to the Ruby application. So going closer potentially to the in-memory cache rather than going to say the external Redis uh, caching layer. So uh, it, it's dynamic based on the traffic pattern. So we don't have to force something if we don't need it to be very close uh, and we don't have to force something to be very, very far if we actually need it now because there's a flash shale event going on and we need that capacity to make sure everything is fast. Yeah, just to like finish like that thought of uh, Maxime is that the, we try to fit like some, uh, the, for example, the memory cache sometimes is not being used at all for small shop is only making one request every five minutes. There's no point, it's very unlikely that a request will hit the same pod uh, and the same uh, does avoiding unnecessary objects influence the readability of your code? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, no, I think it's definitely a pattern and it's, yeah. and it's a mindset to get used to. So it's definitely not the regular idiomatic Ruby you would see in uh, like textbook Ruby for sure but it doesn't affect it negatively enough to say, this is a pile of, of spaghetti code I, I can't read. Uh, the major things that are changing is really using say map bang, for example, instead of a regular map, then instead of having a single line where everything is happening there, you're just gonna have another line to return that specific object once it's modified, but there really isn't that big of an impact. Yeah, there isn't much of a change except for extra uses of constants you see around like with like the idea of last allocations. Yeah, and as Maxime said, like bang, next map with a bang, but nothing more than that. Awesome. Uh, I actually learned some things. I didn't know, was, like using the exclamation mark, you call it bang before. <laughs> so I was like, that's an awesome word. Sorry uh, for my sidebar <laughs> there. Um, our next question is, why is Shopify still using Ruby and not another language? 
That's a great question that I've heard m multiple times. Even internally, uh, folks were like, Ruby, you're using Ruby. <laughs> like, what, what are you doing? You're trying to make this fast. Yeah. And you knew this, this, this question would come up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the main answer to this is basically we have so many people at Shopify that are familiar with Ruby that it would be a tremendous waste of brain power and knowledge and skill to use something else. So that's really the core answer. But really in terms of the technical side of things, that was the business side. The technical side of things is that uh, the liquid implementation of uh, like the gem that we use uh, was initially written in Ruby. The previous implementation in the monolith was in Ruby because it was Ruby on Rails. So porting everything we needed from one to the other is so much easier because we keep the same language. So assuming we were to go for another language, we would have to one, port the business logic, but also port it to another language, which is another level of difficulty to deal with, uh, which is already hard enough when you're trying to do a full on, full on rewrite of a critical piece of a, of a, of a businesses. Yeah, and solution. also like all the gems and all the libraries that we use um, can be just be reused, right? So the idea was also to speed up um, yeah, development at this point. And Great. nothing blocks us as well from using, um, extending more stuff into C level, right? To uh, speed up things. Cool. Okay, our next question is, how are you measuring the new implementation's progress? And how are you moving traffic to the new, implementa well, the new implementation without uh, downtime? So I wanna, um, okay, yeah, no, sure, I can. Uh, okay, uh, Okay, so okay, so two parts. The first one was how do we measure the new implementation progress? That's a Correct. that's an interesting uh, that that's been an inter interesting story internally in how we got to be done with the project and say okay we're we're now at uh, parity. Um, so the way this worked is basically in the face in the first uh, blog post that we shared in the uh, the chat earlier, uh, we explain how we have this verifier mechanism that basically looks at traffic. Uh, coming into Shopify's infrastructure. And then we built it so that we can send that request uh, to both the previous implementation and to our new implementation. So Anita just uh, mentioned that article. Now, if you want to go and read that, uh, of course, I'm biased. I wrote it, but I'll put it a TLDR. <laughs> uh, so uh, it basically sends traffic to both implementations. And based on the responses of both these uh, applications, we then compare them, just like a regular Git diff, uh, a line-by-line -line analysis of, say, uh, it's a product page. Uh, maybe there's something missing in our new implementation. Say the footer didn't show up correctly because it's missing HTML tags or something. And then we know that something was wrong. So the verification uh, process tells us that something is wrong. And we have a, a, a larger dashboard eventually that tells us, okay, that percentage of requests uh, was passing successfully. Everything is good. But then look at those here that are failing and you have to figure out what's going wrong. So keeping track of that metric based on continuous traffic real world requests from people coming out uh, to our platform and using that to basically see what's the real world gap in terms of where we need to be compared to where we are now. So that's the first uh, question. Second was how do we move traffic to that new application? So same thing, we're using that verifier mechanism again to say uh, the, the endpoints, say the product page or index page that are the closest to being done and saying, okay, we're now ready for this to be moved on to the new application and then we do it. So we continue going, go through what's missing, what's broken, what's not yet at parity, and then one by one, get them all to 100% and then start shifting traffic away to uh, from the old one to the new one. So that's a TLDR, but of course the blog post has a lot more details in it. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. So if you have questions, please ask them in the chat, use the question mode and we'll get to them and I'll get on to the next one. Uh, we have, what is next on your agenda and where do you see more potential for optimizations? So I want to, or I can. Yeah. Uh, so optimizations, um, we have more like caching ideas of things that we can, we think, or with few ideas that we want to experiment uh, to either route traffic more to one specific region or to one specific type of machine. Um, there are more patterns that we need to understand that we're trying to like, that we also want to experiment in terms of um, identifying um, like 
the bookkeeper idea that Maxime mentioned that we first, the first request we do like the, the slow request and load all the things multiple times. And then the second time we try to be, we, we learn from that. And the second time we load everything in one go, uh, we can also do smart things and try to um, learn patterns for different shops. Like we know that this specific shop before even like the first request, we know that they, this shop has this specific shape. Um, so we know that we can just, okay. So I know that I have to at least try to load things ahead of time and hopefully this is good enough. And then you learn from that first request if you didn't use all of it or you just use more than you actually fetched. So there are more areas that we can improve on that side. Um, yeah, and then of course doing more improvements on not only on the Ruby side, but on the liquid side, which is also moving a lot of things into C level. Um, yeah, just all the areas, all the areas in the code that we want to, um, that we have some ideas to explore. Another thing is, uh, in terms of runtime, right now that's running regular C Ruby, just MRI, uh, but we are exploring running another runtime. Uh, so Truffle Ruby, Chris Seden, uh has talked about this in a previous uh, Ship It uh, event, I believe. So I think Anita will send that over, but we're exploring maybe using a different runtime to potentially optimize things and pre-compile or compile things as we go to make things faster. So uh, that's another layer of things we're exploring. Yeah, I just shared the link in the chat. It also has uh, Chris's Ship It episode uh, video embedded, so you can read and watch uh, his episode here. Okay, let's move on to our next question, which is, is the opt... Uh, uh, is the optimization... <laughs> optimization speed should be started start applying in the back end or the front side like where should you start should you start optimizing in the back end or is the front end give you more bang for your buck i hope i'm paraphrasing paraphrasing in the right way yeah uh, bandar it is a good question uh the it's so because shopify is a multi-tenant uh platform it really depends on a shop or shop basis but I would say that on a global perspective, if I were to look at all shops and like figure out some sort of generic uh, suggestion for both uh, small shops and large shops, I think it makes sense to start with the server side because that's what the merchant does not control. That's what we Shopify have control over and that's what we should optimize to make it as fast as possible for everyone. Now, in terms of client side optimizations, there's the Shopify themes team that's working here to build the fastest themes possible uh, is also something that we can leverage and that we can make the fastest client side themes uh, that we can. So we're trying to really work on this on both ends. But of course, everything that a merchant or a partner does on a specific theme afterwards, that's not really in our control. We can help, uh, but say if, say, a merchant adds uh, calls of various JavaScript uh, scripts on different servers or um, implements it in a way that's not efficient, then uh, at that point, there's not a lot that we can do. So we try to get what we do have control over, which is to make things as fast as possible on the server side to really get that first byte out of our servers to your machine or the buyer's machines as quickly as we can. And then if we can get uh, the fast storefront uh, themes to be done on our side as well, so that when a merchant starts out, they have the fastest storefront render uh, engine on the server side and the potentially the fastest theme going on on the client side to make sure that all in all, it's the fastest experience possible for commerce. So, so anything yep, that, to that's, that? that's, that was pretty good. Yep. Um, I'm going to like expand on that. Like if now, if you, that question was asked for like a general SaaS company, where do you think um, they should go back end or front end? Like, you know, depending on, I guess, if they control the front end. Yeah. I guess it really depends where the pain point is. Um, I guess the most important thing is, is identifying your biggest bottleneck. Uh, what is a slowdown? Like, what is a slowdown application? If your backend is like, our budget is like a 200 millisecond. That's the our goal. Um but if your application, your back end is taking one second and one second is still okay, but your front end is taking like two seconds to render things on your side, go on that one first. 
Um, data really depends. I guess tracing, dashboarding, profiling are the tools that you have to use. Um, yeah. So you don't know what you don't measure. So if yeah. you don't measure anything, you have no idea what's still what's fast. And if you do measure, you have a much, much better idea. And then you can figure out those bottlenecks that Cecil mentioned. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Our next question is how much uh, faster is the new project compared to the previous implementation? So kind of like giving it away, but it, can you share some like deeper stats on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, on average, across all shops uh, and all requests of all types on storefronts, it's roughly four to five times faster than the previous one. Again, because Shopify is a multi-tenant application, it really depends on a shop or shop basis. So on some shops, we've seen 20 time improvements in the, the new application. In others, we've seen something like two times faster up, uh, response times on the server. So it depends on average four to five times. I think the main win we've seen internally is that uh, in terms of its efficiency, how the application runs, it uses for the same load, same traffic, same pattern of requests. Uh, the new implementation uses four times less CPUs in, in terms of compute power than the previous one. Yeah. So uh, it is uh, it provides more capacity for a lot less uh, or, or smaller amount of uh, CPU power. So for us, that's big wins. We can scale to more computers uh, when we get into hello scenarios and uh, the other nice thing is that because it scales linearly, uh, if we have more load coming in and we can't handle it with the amount of computers we have, we can literally throw more computers at the problem and it scales in a linear fashion. So we have a, a, a somewhat safer approach rather than reaching this, uh, you know, this trend line that we can go over for, for what we've seen uh, so far, it's really, it's, it's linear. So there's no, uh, there's no maximum value there. Awesome. Okay, uh, we're coming in to the end. So we got one more question left that we're going to go with. Uh, how do I secure my server from external developers theme code? What if uh, an external developer uploads a theme that's that takes a lot of processing to perform? We don't. We analyze it and then learn from it and know what we can actually do to improve, like, it has has happened during the development of our project that um, I've, we, as Maxim said, like we have the verifier, which is we shadow requests from core from the previous implementation. Um, and then sometimes the previous implementation will execute and in one second, we were running 10, like why? And then we understood, verify, like check the memory consumption, patching the data and stuff like that. And then we were, okay, we're now able to run it in half the time. So we don't. Um, sometimes we have to work with, um, uh, or at least mention the merchant to be like, oh, if you do this, this is a, a better way to do it, or at least or it's, a, it's a faster way to do it. But mostly it's on our side to uh, optimize everything and optimize um, data fetching and um, runtime processing time. So. I'll be quick to add two more things. Uh, so we are trying to get better at this because it's not necessarily fun to have something come up and realize that, oh, it's now slower. What happened? Uh, the, the main one is uh, going into your online store channel in your merchant admin. Uh, there is a online store speed report section that you can see where uh, based on given events, if you added a new theme, if you removed a theme, if you changed something somewhere, uh, it's going to line up in terms of a timeline to show you what made it faster or slower. So there's a score there you can see how you're doing in terms of performance. And the second one is what I mentioned earlier, the uh, Shopify theme inspector thing. Uh, it basically shows you what is slow. So if something happens and you don't really know why something is slow, you can have a better idea with that too. Yep, good point, Max. Great, thanks. I was actually gonna follow up and ask you like, where do we service this for, uh, for our merchants and developers? So you answered my question for me, thank you. Um, awesome. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Celso and Max, for being here. It's like, you know, mid-December. Everybody's ready to, like, chill out and have a nice holiday. Um, so there will be a video of this event after, uh, and it'll be posted on the engineering blog. You can follow us on Twitter or sign up for our newsletter to get updates when that happens. Everyone that's signed up for this event will get an email from me um, with a link to the video. 
we're hiring 2021 20, engineers in 2021. So head over to the career page and take a look at the open roles that are available. Uh, I want to thank all of you for spending this hour with us. Uh, we're touched by how many of you joined us, considering it's the middle of December and most people are getting ready to go on vacation and are checking out. But we really enjoyed your questions. They were amazing. And we hope we've given you some things to think about of making your uh, Ruby application a little bit more performant. Um, with the video email, there'll be a survey. We want to know what you like about the show. We want to know what you don't like and what things you want to hear from about from us. Um, we have a new, uh, the, we're coming back in January uh, 2021. So September, tw I mean, September, January 27th <laughs> is our next Ship It. And we'll be talking about resiliency there, um, kind of uh, building on our recent posts in the BFCM series about resiliency and how we plan for that for large scale events. So follow us again on Twitter or sign up for the mailing list, you'll get updates about when that registration um, link will go out. Uh, but thank you. Happy holidays. Stay safe. Uh, and we will see you on the flip side of 2021.